السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أن الحمد لله نحمله ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد we start in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the most high the one to whom belongs all praise the one to whom return all affairs the one who we worship the one who we seek the one who controls the good and everything that we see سبحانه وتعالى and we send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam and his family and his followers and his companions until the end of time. Ameen. Before I get into the topic today, which is not a continuation of what we started before. If you remember before we started some of the foundations of Islam and we talked about aqidah, we talked about belief and we we're supposed to talk about worship and other things. But it seems like every couple weeks there's something else that needs to be addressed. So eventually we'll get back to it inshallah. And before I get into the major topic for today, there's two foundational principles that need to be addressed from the beginning. The first foundational principle is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God glorified and exalted as He, has elevated and honored human beings. That God has elevated and honored human beings and given them innately in and of themselves a special place. And that as such they should be as well by each other honored and appreciated and respected and given the dignity that they deserve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ He says about the creation of Adam alayhi salam, So when I form him and I breathe into him from my soul, then fall to him in prostration. We know this is the story of the creation of Adam alayhi salam, that when God created him and he made him the way that he made him, then he commanded the angels to prostrate to him. And the angels fell in prostration and we know that Iblis, Shaitan, rejected to do that. But the point here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when I create him, when I breathe into him, this is all part of the honoring of the human being that it has a special place. We have a special place that no one else has. And with that special place comes a special responsibility. He also says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَقَدَ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَّلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِنْ 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 خَلَقُنَا تَفْضِيلًا He says, we honored and dignified the children of Adam. And we carried them in the oceans and in the earth. We gave them different means to spread out into all over the earth. And we gave them from the good and clean provisions, pure provisions, tayyibat. We gave them good things to sustain themselves. And we gave them precedence, a great precedence over much of what we created. This is what God is saying, that we gave a special place to these human beings. And we gave them sustenance, and we gave them this, and we gave them that. Sometimes people say, if God is so just, then why are there people who are starving in the world? And the short answer to that question is that human beings are not just. This has nothing to do with the justice of Allah. This has to do with the shortcomings of human beings. That we're given the opportunity and the responsibility to make a decision about how they live their lives and how they live. What, what are the things that dictate and, and change and alter how they look at the world and how they engage the world. Those are questions that have to be answered. But Allah has given the capacity to human beings to make those decisions. And most of the times or many times, they make decisions that lead to the oppression of others. So point number one is that Allah has clearly, in the Qur'an, in the example of the Prophet wasallam, established and noted that human beings must be respected for their humanity, first and foremost. That all of us that exist, regardless of color, regardless of race, regardless even of religion, we have rights and we have dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And that should not be taken lightly. 
Sometimes you see people, they walk around as if, you know, like in Egypt, they will say he's madrub. Like you walk around and you see the person, they look like, they just look weak and they look oppressed and they look sad and they look uh, like they've been smacked in the back of the head too many times. And this is contrary to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Allah is telling you from the, from the beginning that you are the creation of the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the special choice of him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you should carry yourself with dignity, with honor, with respect. This is point number one. Point number two is that Allah has prohibited transgression between human beings and between the earth in general. He has prohibited transgression. What does that mean? In the most base form, that means that if you act unjustly towards someone else, you will be held accountable for it. Or towards the creation even. It's not just people. If you go and you dump toxic waste into rivers and water sources, you know, I believe it's one third or two thirds, I can't remember, of the world's population have access to clean water. It's, if you go and do this, it's an injustice. It leads to the injustice of human beings as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states this in many different places in the Quran. And he says, وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ He says, do not transgress the bounds. Verily, Allah, God does not love the transgressors. Those who overstep the bounds of others, who commit injustices and dhulm, oppression to others, Allah does not love those people. And there's actually a spiritual twist in there if you're paying attention. That in the end of the day, all of your life and all of your endeavors are actually seeking to attain the love of Allah. So there's a little bit of a reminder in there also, not only just don't oppress, but also that Allah does not love those who oppress. So that means if you engage in oppression, you've now negated your primary goal in life, which is to seek the love of your Creator. So there's a little element in there as well. If you look at this kind of, this verse actually, this concept of لا تعتدو in the Qur'an, you'll see it in a number of different places. I thought it was very interesting. One of them is in physical aggression. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's talking about jihad, when he's talking about this war for the sake, or this battle for the sake of justice, he says, and then there's going to be a point when you should stop that. There's now a possibility for a treaty, there's a possibility for peace. Do not transgress that. لا تعتدو. That this is not something that you should do at that time. So this oppression, this injustice or transgression of bounds is referred to in a physical context. In another context, it's referred to in a spiritual way. You'll understand why I'm saying this in a little bit. In a spiritual way. It talks about how Allah has prohibited certain things and Allah has allowed certain things. So don't make things allowed that are not allowed and don't make things that are prohibited that, that, are, that are prohibited allowed. Don't do the job of God. God has laid down His rules. Let God do his job, you do your job. And then it says afterwards, لا تعتدو. It says in the context of this, do not transgress those bounds. So now is also a spiritual kind of when it comes to the, the, the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the deen, also do not commit transgression. The third point that gets mentioned is also in domestic context. When it's talking about divorce and this concept of ruja, of, of returning to one's spouse after divorce, it says, don't keep doing this over and over and over again in order to cause harm to the wife. And the word that's used is la ta'atadu. It's the same thing. Do not transgress this boundary. So when Allah talks about this transgression, He talks about it in a number of ways. Sometimes we limit that. But there's many different ways that transgression can occur. And the second point, you know, this is in the Quran in many different places. Allah also says, وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِن نصير. And there is no aid or helper or victor for those who are oppressors. They will have no aid. And he says, or the Prophet wasallam says, Beware of dhulm. Beware of oppression. Because oppression is clouds of darkness and oppression on the day of judgment. That those things that you did in this life, when you stand before God, all of that will come and it's going to cloud you in many different ways. And it should be something that's born, that's, that's, we're aware of it. So the two principles before we talk about the subject, are those. One, that Allah has affirmed and confirmed the humanity of human beings that should not be related to number two, transgressed upon. That we have rights, we have honor, we have dignity, and that dignity should not be transgressed upon by other things. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a very profound hadith when he asked his companions, do you know who is al-muflis? Do you know the one who is bankrupt? 
And the companions of the Prophet them, they said, the Muflis, the bankrupt one, is the one that has no wealth. They have no wealth. And the Prophet them, he said, no, the bankrupt is not the one who has no wealth. The bankrupt is the one who has a lot of prayer and a lot of fasting and a lot of charity. And they come on the day of judgment and people come to them and they say, you oppressed me. And because of that oppression, those people who they oppressed will take their good deeds. And they will take their good deeds and they will take their good deeds and they will take their good deeds until there's nothing left. And then after that, they will go even below subprime in their bankruptcy. And they will start to take the bad deeds of the people that they oppressed because they don't have any more good deeds to give in order to weigh out that balance. This is the true one who is bankrupt on the day of judgment. The bankrupt is the one who is bankrupt on the day of judgment, not in this life. Which brings us to the topic which will probably uh, get me some friends and some enemies. If there's space, people can move in. Otherwise, there's space outside. The topic is abuse. The topic is abuse. And abuse can happen in many different ways and it can have many different definitions. If you just go online and type in abuse, you'll see 20, 30 different categorizations of ways that people can abuse others. Basically, what I put it down to, although I'm not a specialist in mental health or psychology, is that you're really dehumanizing someone by transgressing upon their rights and oftentimes this happens with an imbalance of power. So how, when is there abuse? You're abusing someone if you're dehumanizing them by taking their rights away and oftentimes there's an, there's an imbalance of power. And this can happen in many different ways, like I said. It can happen in workplaces, it can happen in homes, it can happen in communities, it can happen between congregations and their leadership. There's many different types of abuse that can exist. But I want to focus on four and just mention them very briefly so that we can have an understanding of them and we know that they exist. And then at the end, I'll talk about some things that can be done. So these four are psychological, physical, spiritual, and sexual. Psychological, physical, spiritual, and sexual. Number one is psychological. Psychological abuse falls into this verbal aggression, uh, dominant behaviors, excessive jealousy, not to say that people aren't going to be jealous sometimes, but excessive jealousy. Um, these are all things that fall under this concept of psychological abuse. And if anyone's thinking, well, where is the evidence from the Quran and Sunnah? It already preceded. There'll be some more that come, but it already proceeded. This is essentially an issue of the, of, of the taking away of human beings' rights, of their dignity. So if you're in a home where someone transgresses the boundaries of the other person all day long, yelling at them, telling them they, threatening them with harm, saying that they hate them, saying that they're stupid, saying this and this and this and this and this, all these things to them, speaking to them in a bad way, all of this is verbal aggression. All of this falls under the category of psychological abuse and it has major consequences. They found actually in some research that people who live in homes where psychological abuse occurs, they oftentimes show the same levels of post-traumatic stress disorder as people who have fought in wars. Because every single day they're getting it. They're getting abused in their head. And this is against what Islam is teaching because Islam is teaching us to have well-being. It's teaching us to be good, to be pure, to treat people well, to speak to them in a nice way. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about marriage, like think about marriage. If you have psychological abuse, verbal aggression in marriage. Actually, some of the research shows that it's more common even from women than men. So it's not only a men-related issue. It applies to women as well. But if you're constantly berating someone, if someone's afraid of you, and you're in your home, that's a problem. That's a problem. And it's contrary to the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In every possible way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, as we know, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Did you notice the word? From His signs is that He created for you wives so that you can تَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Spouses so that you can تَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you can have second. So that you can have tranquility. So that you can have peace. So that you can have calm. So that you can have relaxation. Not so that you can leave the craziness of the world and go into another war zone in your home. That's not second. It contradicts the verse. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also says, Qulni ibadi yaqulnulnati hiya ahsan, inna shaytana yanzaghu baynahum. That tell my servants to say that which is best. Because shaytan will sow discord between them. This is the way it is. The, the verse is commanding you to say what is best. Not even to stop the harmful. But to go above and beyond that, to say what's best. To say a good word. To say a calm word. To say a nice thing. To bring some happiness into the heart of someone else. All of this is from the teachings of Islam. But to go against it, obviously we result in things like psychological abuse. Sometimes this can happen at work. I know one brother, at least, has spoken many times about the abuse that he received at work. Because he's a Muslim. That a number of people would taunt him. A number of people would say different things to him. They would joke with him and call him a terrorist. They would joke with him and ask him, you know, different things. They would mess with him in different ways. And a lot of us now, we don't take these things seriously. But this is psychological abuse. This is verbal aggression. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. And if anyone faces anything like this, I urge you, please, please reach out to CARE. CARE deals with this on a regular basis. Please reach out to them. If people don't reach out and say what's happening to them, there's no way to have statistics and there's no way to address the problem. So if there is some sort of bullying or aggression or abuse that you're facing psychologically, verbally at work, please reach out to CARE. If you have this going on at your home, get help. And that doesn't mean come to the imam. I'm going to come to that later. Get help from people who this is their field. They can actually help you in it. Alhamdulillah, we have a growing community. We have a lot of resources. Again, I don't want to jump the gun. We'll get to it later. The second type of abuse that we need to mention, at least and acknowledge its existence, is physical. Physical abuse is does not mean to say that you cannot discipline your child, for example. But it means that you cannot abuse your child. And please, like this ties in also to, to the spousal abu- domestic violence issue, a spousal abuse issue. Please don't come and bring your evidence as the verse when you don't care about anything else. That's offensive to me. When people don't care about prayer, they don't care about controlling themselves, they don't care about improving their lives, they don't care about their responsibilities to anyone else, and all of a sudden they lose their temper, they can't control themselves, they want to act like a child and beat their wife, and then bring the verse as an evidence. That's not your evidence. Even the most strict interpretations of the verse don't allow you to abuse your wife. Or your children, for that matter. Even, the, even if you bring the hadith about when, when they reach seven, tell them to pray, and when they reach ten, beat them, that doesn't mean you abuse them. The word that's used in the text a lot of times in the fiqh books is ta'dib. Ta'dib is not abuse. That deep, if you're going to take it there, which is a, a longer discussion, is to discipline. It's not to abuse. So to leave marks, to hit people, to, to cause to and cause and intend harm. When you're disciplining someone, that's abuse now. This is not just you're disciplining them for their own good. This is abuse. Uh, just as a side note, people who work in masajid, people who work in youth groups and everything else, everyone should be aware of this, we're mandated reporters. Which means that if we have a hunch that you're physically abusing your children, we have to report you. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your kids, okay? This is also a misunderstanding of how the system works. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your kids right away. But if we have a, if we have a hunch that your kids are getting beat at home, and I mean beat, I don't mean like tapped lightly or something in order to get a message across. I'm talking about beatings. Then it has to be reported. This goes for the youth workers and everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ bin ma'ruf." He said, and live with them in ma'roof, in goodness. This is not something, this is obviously referring to wives here. Hunna is women. But it applies to the family in general. That you live with your family in goodness. You don't live with your family in harm, as was mentioned before. Number three is spiritual abuse. We don't have time to elaborate on all of these. But I just want to mention them, and you'll see why when I get to the last one. Spiritual abuse is actually really important as well. And um, it's essentially to mislead or mistreat in the name of God. In the name of religion. And usually it happens because there's an imbalance of power. So I'll give some examples of how this happens. Women, maybe for example, they say that we want, alhamdulillah, in this masjid it's not as bad. In some places, women are like in, in dungeons and basements with no TV, nothing to even know what's going on in the masjid or anything. And then they say, well, we want some way to know what's going on. We want a TV. And then people will say, be quiet, sister. You should have modesty. This is spiritual abuse. You're using the concept of modesty in order to 
take someone's right away, to make to to put them into a place that's worse than when than what they should be in. Another way is when converts come and they talk about different things that upset them in the community or that's interesting to them in the community or things that they think should be improved upon and people accuse them of trying to westernize the religion, quote unquote. This person's just trying to westernize the religion. They're just saying this because they're white. They're just doing this because they're black. They don't actually understand the religion. They're just a convert. This is all spiritual abuse as well. Uh, another example is accusing those who are seeking justice of causing fitna. So someone's actually trying to, someone, maybe someone was abused. This happens in Masajid. I'm not talking about here. This happens across the country. Maybe someone is abused and they come out by, by a decision, not only physically or spiritually. It can just be like they were abused in the sense that they were pushed out of the community without a legitimate reason. And they want to make some sort of claim against them. And then they say, brother, you're causing fitna. This is also a way to control people. So it's using the ideas of religion, using people's own insecurity about their religiosity to control them. This is essentially what it comes down to, which is also a very serious issue. The only way to really deal with that is to learn, to be honest, to be learned and to learn and to be open minded. So you know exactly what Islam is about and you feel comfortable enough in your own relationship with Allah that people can't bully you anymore. This is really, really important. Number four is sexual abuse. And I know people are uncomfortable with this, but it's real. Not only here in the Muslim world too, all over the world, sexual abuse is a huge problem. I know even some shuyukh that said that, and this is, still needs to be up for debate, but they said you can give zakat money to organizations that fight sexual sex trafficking. Because sex trafficking is essentially slavery. So the verse that says you can spend zakat in slavery should be applied to sexual tra sex trafficking. Sexual abuse is a real issue. People actually are affected by this. In our communities, in the greater communities. We're shy about it, yes. But we cannot be quiet about it. We have to acknowledge that it exists. And we have to talk about it. One of the groups in our community that's working on this. And kind of inspired this whole khutbah. is called My Safe Corner. If you go, anyone who's a victim of sexual abuse. I know you're not going to raise your hand. I don't want you to raise your hand. And we don't even want you necessarily to go to the office and say, like, I want to sign up for this because it's embarrassing. I, we understand. And it's hard. But we know that it exists. And people have been affected by this. So there's a sister who's working on uh, starting support groups for this. You can just go to mysafecorner.com or you can go to the ICUI website and there's a link in the bottom right for this and you can sign up for it. Because if you've been the victim of this, you need help and you need support and you need people who can relate to you. So these are all issues that are out there. In the second half, in a few minutes, we'll talk about maybe some of the things to keep in mind and consider as we move forward. أما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى he says يا أيها الذين آمنوا كنوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين الله سبحانه وتعالى he said oh you who believe bear witness to truth and stand for truth and justice for the sake of Allah even if it's against yourselves and your parents and your closest of kin all these issues are are are, are sensitive and they're difficult, but we cannot remain silent. You know, I wanted to tell you guys a story. I forgot to do this earlier. I, alhamdulillah, did not grow up in a household where we had abuse. Alhamdulillah, for the most part. I would say it wasn't there. And as such, I believe that the, hum the natural human response to abuse is that you feel sick. It should be sickening. And I remember vividly, I was thinking about it on the way over here, something that happened when I was a child. And I still remember the scene with absolute clarity because we went one time for lunch in Burger King we had a Burger King close to our house we used to go after games and stuff like that so we went to Burger King and we were sitting there and this family came in and they were sitting at a square table and the mom and dad were sitting on opposite sides and the two sons were sitting on or I don't remember if it was a son or a daughter the two kids were sitting on opposite sides and the dad was quiet and one of the kids would keep kicking the other one under the table. And the mom would say, stop that, don't do that. And he would stop for a little bit. And then she would say, stop that, don't do that. And she did this a couple times. And the father didn't say anything. And finally, after a few times, 
She looks at the father. The father gets up, grabs the kid, pushes him out of the restaurant while hitting him, and takes him out the restaurant and into the van. And you don't, we didn't see them again for the next 30, 45 minutes. And it disturbed me. To this day, it disturbs me. I was probably like 11 or 12 years old. This is, it's, our natural reaction should be that this is upsetting. That if it makes you feel sick. It's not the way that human beings are supposed to engage with one another. So the first thing I want to say is that if you've been a victim to any of this, I'm sorry that you've experienced that. But please don't let the, the abuse that you've received be a barrier between you and Allah. The abuse that you've received is from human beings. It's not from Allah. And your relationship with God should not be ruined because of your oppression that you received from people. Number two is that you should get help. And don't get help from imams. Don't get help from me. Don't get help from people who don't know what they're talking about. Get help from people who know what they're talking about. Get, people, get help from people who are social workers, mental health professionals. Alhamdulillah, in this community, like I said, we're growing. We have a number of Muslim mental health professionals that can help with these kind of issues, that actually care about Islam, that understand the perspective that you're coming from, and can also bring their expertise to bear on the situation at hand. If you do it, you need to get help too. And you need to get help again, not from me, but from people who are professionals about that. And we need to engage seriously and honestly in our own character and spiritual development. Many of these things come out of stuff that can be at least at some level alleviated, by our relationship with God. A lot of abuse comes out of problems of control. A lot of abuse comes out of problems of stress. And if we really understand our relationship with Allah, we should know that we don't control a lot of things. Actually, we don't control most things. We only have our responsibilities and our possibilities. And that we need to engage in our relationship with Him because our relationship with Him will bring ease and comfort and tranquility to our lives and hopefully also reduce the stress that sometimes leads to these kind of circumstances. But this is just an introduction to the topic. It's a huge thing. I'm not an expert on it. But I felt that as the sister came to me and she told me her own stories and the things that happened to her, and I heard actually a number of cases other, from other people in the community, and I'm talking specifically about sexual abuse now. I felt that it's something that needed to be addressed. And it's something that needed to be talked about. And that we as a community need to address these things and discuss these things and think about what are the ways that we can solve them and to engage honestly in that discussion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullah wa kunu ma'as sadiqin o you who believe have god consciousness and be truthful be with the truthful it's an extra expression of be truthful be truthful and honest and upright in the way that you deal with things and discuss things and the rights of others around us we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins and shortcomings and to accept from us the good of what we do we ask him to guide us in all of our affairs and guide us to the straight path and to help our brothers and sisters in humanity and in Islam who are oppressed and seeking uh, justice all over the world. We ask him to feed those who are hungry and to give shelter to those who do not have shelter and to help those who are going through difficult times. Ameen. Allahumma gfir lana dhunubana wa israfina fi amrina wa thabit aqadamana. Allahumma barik lana wa baynana wa wahid kalimatana wa alif bayna qulubina wa wahid sufufana. اللهم تقبل منا واعف عنا واغفر لنا كن معنا ولا تكن علينا وآتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وأقيم الصلاة